and welcome to the Royal Society of Biology Wessex branch. Um, so um, I think, yeah, I think we will make a start um, on introducing um, Dr. Matt Parker. Um, he's a senior lecturer at the leading um, brain and behaviour lab at Portsmouth um, University, which he set up in 2015. Um, his research focuses on neuropsychiatric, neurodevelopmental and neuro neurodegenerative disorders. Um, and his research lead is prim primarily in the zebrafish um, research facility. Um, he uses zebrafish as some research model for humans and has an active clinical research program within Portsmouth Hospital's University NHS Trust. Um, he's published over 70 research articles, reviews and chapters. Um, and um, having seen him speak before, he, um, passionate about the work that he carries out and um, with its applications to um, the neurodegenerative disorders in humans. So without further ado, I'm very um, delighted to welcome Matt and um, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks very much, Rebecca. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Yep, can hear you well. Good. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk for about 45 minutes and then there'll be a chance for some uh, questions and discussion at the end. Um, can I just ask in the meantime, if you've got any questions, if you pop it in the chat box, then uh, Rebecca will be monitoring that and then she can make a note of any questions you might have and then we'll, we'll cover those at the end just so we can uh, keep the talk moving on. So uh, as you can see, and as you'll probably know, because you know what this talk is going to be about, we're going to be talking primarily today about a lot of the work that I've been doing with zebrafish. Now, uh, I'm going to talk more about zebrafish as a model system as we go through the talk. Uh, and I'm going to give you an overview of some of the tests that we've developed, uh, some of which have been in my lab, but also in, in uh, other people's labs, uh, trying to look at ways that we can study these disorders in zebrafish. Um, I should say at the beginning as well, uh, if you are on Twitter, please do follow me at psych underscore genes, which is my Twitter name. And also, if you want to have a look at any of the work that we've done in a little bit more detail, uh, the, the lab website, if you go to www.parker-lab.com, there's a lot more information about the research that we do there, as well as uh, lists of our papers and stuff if you're interested in reading any more. OK, so without further ado... The way I'm going to structure this talk is firstly, I'm going to discuss the kind of background to my work and not only the background to the work that we do in my lab, but also the kind of motivation for doing it. I think something that's important to bear in mind, something that's very important to me and very important to my group is that because we're you know, working with animals and we, we're doing this kind of work, there needs to be a strong motivation for doing it. And so I want to give you the kind of motivation in terms of the reasons why this work is important. I'm then going to describe a little bit, because this is really important for understanding the work that we do, the theoretical framework for the types of experiments that we run in my lab. And what I mean by the theoretical framework is what kinds of biological theories underpin the work that we do. Once we've covered that, because that's really important to really understand what it is we're doing and why we're doing it, we're then going to start talking about zebrafish specifically. And I'm going to introduce you to why, how and what zebrafish are useful for in uh, biological research, but in particular in uh, neuroscience. For the third part of the talk, I'm going to go over some of the data that we've produced in the lab and really feed that into that theoretical framework and explain why zebrafish are really useful for understanding the kinds of research questions that we study in my lab. And then at the end, we'll just briefly touch on some future directions and some of the work that's currently ongoing and what we think zebrafish might be useful for in the future. So just to get started, the title of this talk was Zebrafish as a model for neurodevelopmental, neuropsychiatric and neurodegenerative disorders. So I just wanted to go into a little bit of detail about what these disorders are. I'm sure most of you will have some kind of inclination as to what I mean with these different disorders. Uh, but just, whoops, I went the wrong way. There we go. Um, but just in case you haven't, I just want to go over really what we mean by this. So starting with neurodevelopmental disorders, 
This is a, uh, a quote from uh, a, a paper online by Kaplan. Uh, and these neurodevelopmental disorders are disorders that appear in childhood and are characterized by delays in one or more domains. And those domains can be either social, cognitive, or sort of physical motor domains. So neurodevelopmental orders span quite a few different disorders. Um, they can be neurological in origin. So in other words, they can be, ident be uh, caused by some kind of identified either parental or genetic factor. So an example of that might be fetal alcohol syndrome. So fetal alcohol syndrome occurs when uh, the, the, the mother drinks alcohol uh, during pregnancy, during gest gestation, and that causes a range of uh, social, uh, cognitive, and in many cases, uh, morphological disorders in the offspring. So that would be what we might call a neurological neurodevelopmental disorder. But there's also uh, another category of neurodevelopmental disorders, which we might call neurodevelopmental disorders of unknown cause. Now that might include things like autism. Autism is a bit of a difficult one because that potentially could be neurological in, in some cases, but, but often we don't know and it, it occurs for reasons that are not completely clear, biologically speaking but also things like ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. ADHD is a fairly common childhood disorder, neurological disorder or neurodevelopmental disorder, which doesn't have any known neurological origin at this stage. It doesn't mean it doesn't have one, it's just that we don't necessarily know what that neurological uh, cause might be. Now, Often uh, these neurodevelopmental orders, disorders will co-occur. So in other words, if somebody has fetal alcohol syndrome, they may also have attention deficit disorder. They may also have autism. So there's a high level of co-occurrence within these uh, particular types of disorders. So neuropsychiatric disorders, again, just to give you this kind of uh, uh, kind of catch term that, uh, that, that is from the sort of published literature. These are disorders of affect. Affect means kind of emotion, feeling, that kind of thing. Disorders of affect, cognition and behaviour that are caused by abnormal brain function or from indirect effects of systemic disease. So neuropsychiatric disorders uh, may be as per neurodevelopmental disorders, neurological. So in other words, caused by, again, some sort of identified uh, factor. This might include um, some types of epilepsy, for example. But a lot of neuropsychiatric disorders, uh, ones that I'm sure everybody who's listening to this will be familiar with, will be of an unknown cause. Again, it doesn't mean that they don't have a neurological origin. It just means that we don't necessarily know what that is. And that includes things like anxiety, depression, schizophrenia uh, and substance abuse or addiction, which is a, one of the areas that I'm particularly interested in. Now, as with uh, neurodevelopmental disorders, there are high levels of co-occurrence again. And this is going to be you might notice that I've mentioned this a couple of times now. And you may pick up that this this issue of co-occurrence is an important theme and something that is going to keep coming up during this talk. And, and is something that's really important for the for the kind of theoretical framework of what, what our work covers. So this high level of co-occurrence means that if somebody has anxiety, they may often have depression as well. Indeed, if people have neurological psychiatric disorders, so things like epilepsy and so on, they may also have uh, a higher likelihood of co-occurrence of other neuropsychiatric disorders as well. And finally, neurodegenerative disorders. Now, this is something that um, anyone who was at my uh, talk a, a year or two ago um, at the school will know that, that this is something that we've been doing some work on over the last few years in quite a lot of detail in my lab. So neurodegenerative disorders, these are disorders that are characterized by progressive degeneration of the structure and function of the central nervous system or the peripheral nervous system. So these are again, as per the others, uh, potentially caused by identified genetic factors. So examples of identified genetic factors that underlie neurodegenerative disorders are early onset familial Alzheimer's disease. So we know there are a series of genes that are uh, very strongly linked to early onset familial Alzheimer's disease. Uh, but also things like Huntington's disease, for example. So we know that if somebody carries the Huntington gene uh, mutation, then that will lead them to uh, acquire Huntington's disease. So these are caused by specifically identified genetic factors. But they can also be of unknown cause, similar 
to the other disorders. So, uh, for example, idiopathic Alzheimer's disease. So in other words, Alzheimer's disease that occurs spontaneously uh, in aging, for example, or Parkinson's disease. These are things that have at, at the moment unknown cause. Now, again, the important thing to remember is that's not to say that they do not have a genetic basis or they don't have a specific neurological basis. It's just that we haven't necessarily identified that yet. Now, with neurodegenerative disorders, there are very high levels of comorbidity, so co-occurrence, uh, with neuropsychiatric disorders, so things like depression, for example. Now, it may not surprise you to know that people with, uh, for example, Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease and Huntington's disease will have depression and or anxiety because, as you can imagine, if you have one of those disorders, it can be psychologically very challenging and obviously those huge changes in your life will be likely to cause additional psychiatric kind of effects but the, the point is really that we know that there are very high levels of co-occurrence and comorbidity with a range of psychiatric conditions so the likelihood is is that there is some kind of similarity uh, in terms of the underlying causal factors so what's the motivation for doing this work? Well, one of the problems we have, and this may have kind of, you may have picked up on this through what I was saying, or it may indeed be something that you, you knew anyway, is that there aren't a huge range of successful treatment options for any of these disorders, be they the neuropsychiatric, neurodevelopmental, or neurodegenerative disorders. And in fact, the existing treatments are um, severely lacking in efficacy despite the fact that you know it's been more than 60 years since we've been doing work on these disorders not my lab <laughs> i'm not quite that old um but people have been studying these in a lot of detail in terms of understanding these disorders for for, for you know, really a couple of generations now and they haven't really improved so pharmacological treatments for example haven't really come on very far in the last 60 years uh, and actually, you know, we use this term palliative because, you know, as you may know, palliative means that you're essentially treating the disorder in terms of the symptoms, but you're not treating the sort of causal factors underlying it. So it's not a curative treatment. It's a palliative treatment in the sense that um, you're not actually making the person better. You're just dealing with the symptoms. So for all of these disorders, there have been some inroads in pharmacology, but they haven't really got to the basis of the disorders yet. And they certainly haven't developed curative treatments, at least uh, for most of these, um, and at least, you know, things that work really well across the board. One of the reasons I think, and many others in this work, in this field, think that we don't have particularly efficacious therapies is because we don't understand the fundamental biology. As was probably clear from the last few slides that I said, we don't understand the underlying factors for many of these conditions. We might understand some of the neurological correlates, so some of the things that happen at the same time, but we really don't know a huge amount about the uh, fundamental biology. And because of the way that psychiatry is, I guess, uh, sort of clinically organised in terms of fairly high level constructs of disorders, that actually doesn't help the situation because instead of focusing on measurable biological factors, it focuses on these collections of symptoms, which as a collection, as you could see from the previous slides, huge levels of comorbidity and co-occurrence, those high level catch all terms aren't always that useful and certainly aren't useful in terms of developing treatments because of the fact that, that there is such a high level of crossover. So based on this, it seems obvious really to me, but certainly to, to many people, um, that we need to look at, at shared phenotypes. So we need to look at factors that actually are shared between these to try to understand more about the biology of those specific phenotypes. And if we could do that, then we could concentrate on them in terms of developing treatments rather than these kind of slightly unhelpful, um, imprecise neuropsychiatric constructs. So um, I'm going to say three words which uh, you may not know what any of them mean. I'm going to explain what all of them mean now, because this is this is the basis of our of our work. Um, and these three words are transdiagnostic neurocognitive endophenotypes. OK, so apologies now to get that now, but I'm going to explain exactly what they mean. Um, 
So the first word is transdiagnostic. So that means that it's present across several diagnoses or present in several disorders. And that really goes to the core of what I was saying about, you know, this co-occurrence between different disorders. So it's present across several disorders. Neurocognitive, neurocognitive function is cognitive functions where we know that there is some close relationship between that function and a specific neural pathway or a specific anatomical locus within the brain within the central nervous system okay so neurocognitive is not just cognitive which is you know maybe some behavioral or thought process it's something where we know there is a specific biological signature attached to that cognitive process endophenotypes uh, so the end endophenotype concept was something that was initially uh, written about way back in the 1960s um, really um, by Irving Gottesman who uh, brought over um, this term endophenotype so Darwin talked about exophenotypes a lot um, if you're familiar with Darwin Darwin's work you'll know about exophenotypes um, but endophenotypes are um, were, were almost a way of, of kind of talking about non-evolutionary processes that were important in terms of individual development. Now, endophenotypes are kind of intermediate phenotypes to the main disease phenotype. And I'm gonna explain a little bit more about it in a minute because it's really important. But these endophenotypes can either be biological or cognitive. So let's just have a quick look at what I mean by an endophenotype. So within this graph, what you'll see is, is three sort of, uh, uh, three categories, if you like. So the first one is genotype. Everyone here, uh, I don't want to insult your intelligence, will know uh, what the genotype of a person is. Um, and you'll know that within genotypes, you might have uh, genetic variants. So, for example, you might have uh, variant A and variant B of a particular genotype. Now, imagine the, the kind of frequency in the population is 50% variant A and 50% variant B. So in itself, that isn't particularly helpful if you're trying to look into um, understanding uh, the, the genetics of a disorder, if you get sort of 50% having uh, this particular genotype and 50% uh, having the other. So if you then move to the end, which is that we're just taking ADHD here because ADHD is a, a disorder that we study in my lab. So um, the ADHD phenotype, uh, things like inattention, fidgeting, poor concentration, boredom, impulsivity, talking a lot, in inability to wait and so on. These are um, ADHD related phenotypes and within the ADHD population they're randomly distributed, normally distributed within the ADHD population. So we need a way of understanding the kind of link between those ADHD phenotypes and genotype. Okay, if we want to understand the biological basis we need to understand the underlying biology from that whole sequence from genetics right the way through to the phenotype. Now endophenotypes are really useful and endophenotypes as I said on the last slide can be either biological or cognitive and in the case of uh, for example ADHD we know that people with ADHD have a series of a biological and cognitive endophenotypes. So an example might be um, on the left hand side here, you can see a biological endophenotype, which is the fMRI. And that fMRI shows reduced blood oxygen levels uh, in the um, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is a part of the brain. Uh, and you see this in children with ADHD during waiting tasks, which suggests some kind of uh, neurological deficit within that brain region. Right. So within that fMRI, you can see this neurological signature for this particular behavior. If you move over to the right, uh, at the same time as that, you also see cognitive endophenotypes. OK, so they are uh, within within this uh, little picture I put up um, is a, a kind of mock up of something that we call the stop signal reaction time task. And the stop signal reaction time task is uh, essentially a task where you can um, look at uh, whether somebody's able to wait in order to perform a particular behavior. So it's a cognitive task that we know that people with ADHD show relatively poor performance. And actually, if you look at the distribution within that endophenotype in the population, you actually see more of a, a sort of bimodal distribution where you get a group of people that show uh, particularly high levels of this endophenotype or low levels of this endophenotype. So you start to pull, a, pull apart those populations. So instead of it being those two specific genotypes or that one uh, ADHD phenotype, you have these two phenotypes. Now, if you imagine um, if you if, for example, the people with ADHD happen to fall within one of those uh, peaks within that 
graph frequency graph at the bottom you could then say well actually maybe we'd be able to look at some predetermined uh, behavioral or cognitive or, or uh, biological markers that might end up giving us more of an idea uh, as to where they fell within this ADHD uh, pyramid. So endophenotypes are really useful because they give us that kind of snapshot into the underlying biology um, which then allows us to kind of look back if you like into the genotype and really understand functionally what's important in ADHD and what's really nice about these endophenotypes is not only do you see these patterns in people that have ADHD or schizophrenia or other disorders you also see them in their first degree relatives so people with ADHDs first, so imagine this second peak was our ADHD population, you will see that those people will be in that peak before they have the full blown phenotype, right? So before they develop ADHD, if you screen them, if you test them, you'll see that they fall higher up on that curve. And then you'll also find, uh, and there's data to, to show this, that their first degree relatives are more likely to fall in that higher end of that distribution. Than the general population so if you look at the general population you'll find that the relatives the first degree relatives of people with that disorder will show those endophenotypes so they're really useful in terms of that intermediate pathway between that intermediate view if you like between genotype and, and phenotype and what's also really good sorry but to bang on about it but it's important to know this is that um, these are um, in order to be a good endophenotype, it needs to be objective and it needs to be measurable, right? So we should be able to test it in the laboratory. And that's where a lot of the work that we do comes in. Okay, so in terms of these transdiagnostic neurocognitive endophenotypes, <laughs> um, there's a couple that I want to talk to you about today. Okay, um, so the first one is memory, working memory. Uh, so working memory is essentially your ability to carry out tasks in real time so it's almost like your i guess almost like your referencing system so as you go through life you're always using your working memory in order to know where you are what you're doing at any one time or what you've just done and so on and we know that working memory is uh in terms of deficits in working memory is common uh, not only to neuropsychiatric disorders such as depression um, ptsd and schizophrenia but also to neurodevelopmental disorders, so fetal alcohol syndrome that I've already mentioned, and ADHD, so people with those disorders tend to have working memory problems. Uh, and also neurodegenerative disorders as well, so the dementias, um, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease and so on. Um, the second transdiagnostic neurocognitive endophenotype that I'm going to talk to you about is something called impulsivity. Now, impulsivity is a type of executive function. Um, it's essentially something that allows you to uh, wait and make good decisions about things. And it's a little bit like that ADHD graph I was showing you before, where they have to wait in order to kind of make good decisions. But it also uh, has things to do with, for example, risk taking, as you can see from this picture on the right. Um, you know, one may consider that not to be a particularly good idea um, and actually children it might not uh, surprise you to know uh, tend to be more impulsive than adults and as you go through your life your impulsivity reduces and it's to do with uh, kind of brain maturation and so on but um, you know peak impulsivity is, is when you're younger and, and then it tends to sort of fade off a little bit as you get older. So impulsivity, similar to working memory, is quite common to a range of different disorders. So neuropsychiatric uh, conditions, so schizophrenia, um, people with schizophrenia um, often show high levels of impulsivity. Uh, also addiction, substance abuse, very, very closely linked to impulsivity, uh, but also obsessive compulsive disorder. In terms of neurodevelopmental disorders, people with fetal alcohol syndrome, again, and ADHD both show uh, significant uh, impulsivity uh, when compared to the general population. Um, in terms of ADHD as well, I, I already mentioned the, uh, the first degree relatives and stuff tend also to show high levels of impulsivity, same with addiction as well and schizophrenia. Uh, and in terms of neurodegenerative uh, disorders, people with Parkinson's disease often show high levels of impulsivity as well. So um, I just want to take this, I've got a couple of these slides in where I just want you to kind of think for a minute. I'm not going to stop because we haven't got huge amounts of time, but just sort of pause to think a little bit. Um, I've drawn a, a kind of diagram here that um, I was sort of playing around with, just trying to illustrate the way that this 
uh, these, these neurocognitive endophenotypes work. Um, so if you imagine on the right hand side, uh, we've got all the diseases that I've talked the dis disorders, diseases, whatever you want to call it, that I've talked about. Um, so we have neuropsychiatric at the top, neurodevelopmental in the middle and neurodegenerative at the bottom. Now, if you look at the thicker lines, this is where there is a strong link between this particular endophenotype and that particular disorder. So in other words, the thickness of the line uh, corresponds to the strength of the, um, of the link, if you like, between them. So the strength of how strongly that endophenotype uh, kind of fits in, if you like, or, or figures in that disorder. So you can see at the top, impulsivity in very, very strong in uh, neuropsychiatric conditions, not all neuropsychiatric conditions, but, but a few, um, and also in neurodevelopmental disorders that we talked about already. And there's a kind of weak link between uh, impulsivity and neurodegenerative disorders. The reason it's a bit of a weaker link is because, for example, we know that people with Parkinson's disease have impulsivity. Um, and it seems to be related to the way that people with Parkinson's disease are medicated in terms of dopamine. So we don't necessarily know whether that impulsivity is related to the, uh, the condition itself or maybe related to some of the uh, medications that are taken with uh, for Parkinson's disease. It's not completely clear, but there is a link nevertheless. And then working memory, clearly the strongest link uh, is uh, to neurodegenerative disorders, uh, but there's also a relatively uh, good link to uh, neurodevelopment. I haven't put a line between uh, working memory and neuropsychiatric disorders, although there are some uh, links, but I don't really want to concentrate on that too much today. So although there are links, uh, transdiagnostic links uh, with working memory, we're more focusing on the other two today. So these are good strong links. We know that this, these you know, conditions are associated with these endophenotypes. So then if you move over to the left hand side, you'll see uh, my little diagram of underlying, uh, underlying biology. Now there, it's a lot less well known. So there's a lot of question marks there. Now we've got some ideas. So it's not to say that nobody has any idea what you know what these links are we have you know we have good evidence about uh, for example dopaminergic systems dopamine systems and, and serotonin systems and so on uh, relating to impulsivity and working memory but we don't really understand the biology particularly well and that's where a lot of the research these days is heading is trying to understand this uh, left hand side of the of the diagram here so the underlying biology and you can see um, you know this is just a basic picture of a, a neuronal synapse so even at the you know at the systems level yeah but even at the kind of synaptic level so you know are there you know for example is there some kind of effect in the sort of presynaptic vesicles? Is there some effect on uh, transporter molecules or receptor molecules or even, you know, ion channels or even parts of ion channels, you know, particular receptors on the pre or postsynaptic site? So, you know, I'm talking about it at that level in the sense that, you know, we don't really understand yet what the real underlying sort of molecular biology of these uh, conditions are. So in order to do that, hooray, after... 20 minutes, we're now on to zebrafish. Okay, so I hope now um, you understand a little bit more about the kinds of work that we're doing and why we're doing it. And so now I wanna kind of introduce you to why zebrafish and the kind of work we've been doing with zebrafish and how that fits into everything that I've just told you. Okay, so the reason we use zebrafish, sorry about the little floating um, acetylcholine, dopamine and 5-HT, and you'll see in a minute that will become clear. <laughs> it's meant to be in another picture, but it's floating through into the ether, so it looks like it's sat on a fish's head at the moment. Um, so the reason we use zebrafish, uh, the reason people use zebrafish, um, I, I had to think about, there's about a thousand slides I could have put for this, but I just wanted to give you a quick one that will um, help you understand. Uh, the genome has been fully sequenced, which means they're excellent for genetic research. They're very high fecundity, which means they lay a lot of eggs. So a single female zebrafish will lay up to about 200 eggs every, well, roughly every week. Um, you know, if you keep them in normal conditions, if you, you know, massively overfeed them and, and give them all kinds of funny drugs and stuff, they might lay more than that. But if you just leave them in normal, um, wild ranging kind of conditions, they'll, they'll lay about 200 eggs a week. Compared to other model species, so mice, rats, guinea pigs, so on, uh, they're very low cost. Uh, you know, you can keep a lot of zebrafish in a relatively small, um, you know, uh, uh, animal facility because they're they're only about, you know, sort of three inches long or so, and so you can easily keep a lot of them in a, in a, a relatively small environment and still maintain the welfare. Um, they have a very fast life cycle, 
We use them for aging research, which I'm going to tell you a little bit about in a few minutes. Um, I mean, they're fully aged by um, by about sort of four months, which is similar to mice, but they, they're quite robust even at older ages, so they're good for aging research as well. Um, and one of the reasons that people love zebrafish, especially in the world of genetics, is that they're very robust to mutations. Um, I haven't got time to go into the details of it now, but um, zebrafish have undergo, undergone, because they're evolutionarily quite ancient, they've undergone um, uh, a, a, a full kind of... Um, uh, a full duplication of the genome, which means that they're uh, uh, more genetically robust, essentially. We also know a lot about the neurobiology of zebrafish. So for a lot of the disorders that I've been talking about, you know, we're talking about disorders that occur within the brain and the central nervous system. And now you can see my little floating uh, neurotransmitters there. Um, we know that uh, zebrafish have, um, whoops, I went, back in time there we go uh, zebrafish have very similar kinds of neuronal projections to uh, mammals uh, in the sense that this is the uh, mammalian brain here so this is the rat brain this is the zebrafish brain um, you can see that topographically it's a little bit different in terms of the organization but in terms of the ascending pathways in terms of uh, the main neurotransmitters so cholinergic dopaminergic and serotonergic they are uh, very similar in terms of those pathways so uh, they also have a number of similar uh, brain regions, but they are inverted in, in a lot of senses. So they're, they're a lot of the brain for a zebrafish, what's on the bottom for a fish might be on the top for a mammal. But it doesn't make any difference because the, the, the circuits are still very similar. So um, this is just a little video of uh, zebrafish developing. So you can watch a zebrafish developing under the microscope. So this, uh, you can watch it here. This isn't the speed it develops, this is sped up, um, but you, they move from uh, through the different stages. So if you look on the right hand side, it tells you what the um, stage they're at at any one time. So this is going through the high stage at the moment and you can now see 50% uh, epiboli and 75% epiboli now and then the bud stage as the eye starts to develop and then the eight somite if you look very closely you'll be able to see the somites which is the on the spinal cord um, and then the uh, animal is developed within 24 hours and this is the yolk sac in the middle here um, and that's uh, moving around within the chorion within 24 hours so you get a really nice life cycle and also obviously because they're externally fertilized we can watch that happening uh, under the microscope which is really cool um, now, in terms of uh, zebrafish, uh, just very quickly, I just want to go over, you know, what the, the sort of life cycle, um, as I said before, the, um, if you look at the life cycle, it's relatively quick. So they're adult fish in around 90 days, about three months. Um, they start aging in about two years, and I'll show you some evidence for that in a little while. Um, and they will live in the lab up to about four or five years. Um, we've, we've got them in our lab about four years old at the moment, and they will live up to about five years uh, in, in the lab conditions. Obviously not in the wild, but because they would be predated, <laughs> and they would not live that long. Um, but what you see is um, a number of kind of neurodegenerative effects and cognitive decline starting um, at around the two year mark. Um, now, in terms of um, zebrafish, it's not just me using them. Actually, zebrafish are the second most commonly used model species in the UK. If you look at the Home Office uh, figures and if you look at the number of um, PubMed publications, um, this, this ended in 2013, but you can see zebrafish have been kind of going faster and faster. So if you look at the uh, percentage uh, compared to other uh, different uh, species, they're staying the same pretty much, whereas zebrafish have shown this kind of meteoric rise. Um, but you can see uh, in terms of genetic homology as well, if you look down the list here, um, you know, mice and uh, rats and so on that we use for a lot of our work, uh, not our work, but the, the work in the in the lab and so on, um, lab species, um, they share around 75 to 80% of the uh, genetic homology, whereas zebrafish are around 70%. But what's really good about zebrafish is that they share um, not only that, uh, you know, a decent amount of genetic homology, but they also have all the same uh, neurotransmitter systems. So actually, in terms of the neurotransmitter systems, uh, the, the major ones, so serotonin, dopamine uh, and uh, acetylcholine and noradrenaline, they have the same systems as, as other mammals. And so when you put everything together with fish, um, so in terms of, you know, very simple model systems like Drosophila, um, zebrafish and mice, uh, if you add up uh, in terms of uh, the, their kind of utility across, you know, genetics, um, what kinds of assays they're good for and cost and so on, um, zebrafish do come out uh, on top. So actually zebrafish are, uh, you know, a really useful model for all kinds of different things. Okay, right, so 
I'm going to now introduce you to some of the work that we've been doing in my lab, two things in particular, so the working memory first and then impulsivity. And I'm going to show you how we measure working memory and impulsivity in these um, guys, and then also some of the data that we found, which is starting to help us understand the underlying biology of these two endophenotypes. So um, we developed a protocol in my lab called the Free Movement Pattern Y Maze. Within this Free Movement Pattern Y Maze, you place the fish into an environment that is shaped like a Y, hence the name, and you film the fish for an hour. Okay, now what happens is during that hour, the fish can, if you imagine if you were sat in this maze, um, you basically when you're in one of the arms, you have essentially two choices. You can either turn left or you can turn right. And every time you're in one of those arms, you can make a decision whether to turn left or right. And so what we do is we film them for an hour and we look at their sequential right and left turns. OK, now this uh, uh, at the bottom, as you can see, is just a kind of um, overview of, of what might happen. So say for argument's sake, it was left, left, right, left, and then uh, left, right, left, right, and then right, left, right, left, and then left, right, left, right, and so on. Uh, we then have that. So we have those overlapping what we call tetragrams, which is a series of four choices. Now, what we find is that the most common of those, and you'll see this in a few minutes, um, are repetitions. So um, repetitions are when the animal goes right, and then right again, and then right again. Okay, so it does four right turns in a row. Um, now, what it can also do is alternations, which is left, and then right, and then left. And then, <clears throat> yes, you guessed it, right at the end. Okay, so that's alternation. So left, right, left, right would be alternations, and right, left, right, left. Uh, sorry, left, 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 or right, 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 right would be uh, be uh, repetitions. Now, um, the reason we are interested in these particular patterns is because if you look at the uh, the behaviour of uh, fish within this. So if you look at them over a really long period of time, um, you find that alternations are by far the most common strategy. So if you look on this graph here, this is frequency on the y axis and the tetragrams on the x axis, you can see that left, right, left, right, right, left, right, left are by far the uh, most common uh, things that we see. Um, chance is about 6%. So anything above chance means that it's not random. If they just did any of these, then it would all be at about 6.5%. So it'd be random. Uh, but again, we see these right, left, right, left, and left, right, left, right happening um, in total about 30% of the time. So 15% for each one. All right, so we know that they're important. So we kind of figured that if these are important, if the animals are using them, and it's their main strategy, then it must be something to do with memory, right? Because if you want to turn, if you're alternating and you're going left and then right and then left and then right, you have to remember that you went left last time in order to go right next time. If it was just random and they were just moving around randomly, then memory wouldn't need to matter. But memory must matter because otherwise they wouldn't be able to develop a strategy. So we tested the hypothesis that they were using their memory by using memory blocking drugs. So MK801 is a drug that blocks uh, glutamate, uh, which is uh, a neurotransmitter needed uh, in order to form memories. And if you look at the graph here, their alternations drops uh, from around 35-40% in total uh, down to chance level. So no higher than like 12% uh, in a dose dependent manner when you give them MK801. You get the same with other memory dropping drugs and blocking drugs as well. So not only do we know that this is a memory drug, um, we also wondered whether uh, whether this is a memory uh, assay. We also wondered whether you could see it in other vertebrates. So we also tested it in mice. So you can see in the right hand graph now, uh, this is a mouse in a larger version of the Y maze. So we used uh, zebrafish. Uh, we, we wanted to see whether mice did the same thing. Um, and what we see is if you look at the tetragrams at the bottom here, the zebrafish show the uh, pattern that we've just seen, the high levels of uh, alternations. And if you look on the right hand side, uh, the mice do exactly the same thing. So mice and zebrafish, uh, both vertebrates, of course, both important model systems, both show exactly the same patterns within the Y maze. So the next thing we thought was, well, what happens with humans? So we set up a virtual version of the maze. And in that virtual version of the maze, people went into an online uh, environment where they had to search around the maze. It was shaped like a big honeycomb. So they had to travel around and they could travel around for ages. And you can see you get to these Y points and you can either turn left or right. 
And we tested this on, on lots of different people uh, to find out what would happen uh, in people within the Y maze. And uh, you guessed it, uh, people show exactly the same patterns as uh, the zebrafish. Now, if you look here at the human graph at the bottom, you can see that uh, people within that Y maze show very high levels of alternations. Now, what was really nice about it was that not only did we find that people showed the same patterns uh, of exploration, we also tested this with um, aging zebrafish, because obviously, you know, as I said before, we're interested in cognitive decline, we're interested in aging and so on. Um, and so what we wanted to know is what would happen if uh, an old zebrafish tested it. So um, you can see here that with the young zebrafish and the old zebrafish, you see a deterioration in performance. It doesn't obliterate it completely, but you do see a reduction in those uh, alternations within the older zebrafish. And again, within the humans, you see exactly the same. So we tested young humans, so people uh, around the age of 18 to 25. Uh, and we compared them to older people uh, around the age of 70 to 80. And you can see this cognitive decline uh, in the humans as well. So not only do we see the identical patterns in humans and other vertebrates, but we also see that humans show uh, similar levels of cognitive decline. What was quite interesting with this is that we then tested the uh, zebrafish, the older zebrafish. So we didn't do this with humans, uh, but we did this with older zebrafish uh, by using a, a drug, a, a D1, D5 dopamine agonist, which um, has got some evidence for being what we call a cognitive enhancer. So ability to kind of uh, make the animals a bit smarter, perhaps. Um, and what we saw was that not only did the fish um, show, so the older fish, it kind of re reversed that phenotype. So in other words, it got rid of that, um, uh, that the, the negative effects of the, of the aging. Um, we also then looked at some of the, uh, the brain uh, signals, if you like. So we looked at mRNA levels within the brain using a qPCR, and we looked at different dopamine receptors to try to understand more about what was going on with that aging process. And what we found was that in the older fish, there was an upregulation of the uh, dopamine D5 receptor. But we also found that in the younger fish, when we gave them this drug, they showed a downregulation in uh, dopamine transporter, which suggested that if you have, um, uh, when, when the animals are aging, they're showing a compensatory response potentially through this dopamine D5 receptor, which is why it's upregulated. And it seems to be to do with when you get high levels of dopamine, that um, dopamine transporter gene, which was downregulated when the younger ones took the drug and has no effect in the older ones, uh, may well be kind of uh, messing up the transport of dopamine or the reuptake of dopamine presynaptically. So it suggested within this mechanism that upregulation of, DR, of, of D5 dopamine receptors um, suggested that you've got a compensatory response in aging and because there's no effect of the dopamine transporter, this suggests that you've got some kind of impaired dopamine regulation in terms of presynaptic dopamine regulation within the aging fish. And this is completely new, so nobody's really seen this before. And this suggests that if we then develop drugs that target specifically that dopamine transporter, it might be that that helps people with aging or people with aging, it's not a disease, people who are aging, um, potentially regain some uh, cognitive effects if they're having cognitive decline. So um, going back to our diagram again, we've now uh, potentially filled in part of this. So in terms of neurodegenerative disease, so um, we used aging as a model for neurodegeneration in the sense that you get natural neurodegeneration, but that shows us potentially that the dopamine transporter and the D5 postsynaptic dopamine receptor might be important in terms of um, trying to help with the aging process. Okay, so the second thing that we want to have a look at is impulsivity. So um, we've been interested in uh, whether zebrafish might be able to help us understand a bit about the biology of ADHD. We've also looked at zebrafish as a model for addiction, but um, today we're sort of more concentrating on ADHD. So again, we've got impulsivity, which is this uh, transdiagnostic endophenotype, and we want to understand a little bit more about how impulsivity works at the kind of neuronal level. So we developed a task for zebrafish, which is based on a mammal task, which is itself based on a, uh, a human task, uh, called the five choice serial reaction time task. Uh, 
So if you watch this video, um, so this fish at the end here is swimming about in a tank that has, as you can see, uh, one, two, three, four, five choices. Um, at this end here, it has a uh, start box. So when the fish sees a light come in, uh, come on in that start box, it has to swim into that box. Um, it will then trigger one of the lights at the far end to come on. And then the fish swims into the correct box and then it swims back down this end. And this light here that's on now means that the fish is getting fed. So what happens then is that then that trial's finished and then uh, another trial starts and the light comes on here again. And then the fish triggers it when it's ready to start the trial uh, and then we'll swim up the other end and uh, make a correct choice. Now, once we've trained these fish for quite a long time on this task, um, so you can see a, a kind of version of it here. Um, first of all, we train them just to go into the stimulus lights. It takes a long time to do it. We then train them to initiate trials and so on. It does take quite a long time. Uh, we then start what we call the five choice serial reaction time task. Now, what happens with this is that these stimulus lights at the end during a trial um, are delayed. So in other words, the fish initiates a trial by swimming into this light here. And then there's a delay for about five seconds. And then once that five seconds is finished, then the stimulus light comes on. Now, the reason we do that is because we can then look whether that fish is willing to wait or able to wait for the stimulus light to come on. If the fish don't wait and they swim into the hole before the light has come on, so in other words, they're not waiting for the signal, then the trial restarts and they don't get their food. So in other words, that, that is punished in a sense uh, that the, the animals are not given the food at the end of the trial. So theoretically, the animals should not respond uh, when that, and they should wait for the, the trial to happen. Um, so what we did was we um, looked at fish that had a knockout in a particular gene that is known to be related to attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD. Um, and that gene is latrophilin, uh, latrophilin 3.1. And this gene we know is related to ADHD because it's come up in a, a number of different uh, trials on, on children with ADHD, for example. So um, we created a knockout line. Uh, well, we did, but somebody did who works with us uh, for latrophilin. And you can see here from the Western blot that there's no latrophilin protein being shown. So that's the wild type uh, latrophilin, and there's no latrophilin being formed in the uh, latrophilin knockout. So that proves that it is a latrophilin knockout. Um, the first thing we did was we looked at its uh, impulsive responses, so those anticipatory responses. And what you can see here is that the latrophilin fish showed much higher levels of anticipatory responding, so uh, kind of impulsive responding than the wild type fish. Um, we also did another test called a novel object test, which is kind of looking at risk taking. And they often they also showed a much higher rate of risk taking uh, than the other fish as well. Now, what was really interesting is that if you look at these fish um, after they've had a, uh, a drug called atomoxetine, which is known to uh, treat ADHD, um, you can see in the bottom here um, that that completely abolishes the, uh, the effect of the, uh, or completely abolishes the anticipatory responding. So you can see here, this is the baseline and this is when they've had atomoxetine. It also, um, the atomoxetine, which is a drug used to treat ADHD, uh, completely abolishes um, the uh, novel effect as well. So it, it completely removes those um, kind of impulsive phenotypes. So we did some brain chemistry on them as well. And we found that the uh, latrophilin fish had a down regulation of the serotonin transporter and up regulation um, concurrently of the noradrenaline transporter. So what this tells us is that it gives us another hypothesized mechanism for how um, the uh, atomoxetine might be working, but also what the underlying neurochemistry might be for ADHD. And actually it tells us that the changes in expression levels of noradrenaline and serotonin, um, but again, through the kind of um, uh, synaptic regulation, because it's a transporter molecules, uh, might be um, compensatory mechanisms that are seen within ADHD um, for the underlying impulsivity. So not only is this potentially interesting in terms of ADHD, but it might also be very useful in terms of understanding some other disorders transdiagnostically that might be linked to um, impulsivity. So again, if we look at our diagram, 
Um, we've now potentially, um, through those studies, um, you know, potentially linked to neurodegenerative diseases, but again, it's quite a small link, as we know, uh, but certainly in terms of neuropsychiatric and some neurodevelopmental disorders, um, we may now know a little bit more about some of the molecular mechanisms that underlie those two disorders, which again might help us to develop uh, treatments in the future. So just to summarise, um, the transdiagnostic uh, endophenotypes, neurocognitive endophenotypes, may be very useful for understanding the biology of neurodegenerative, neurodevelopmental and neuropsychiatric disorders. Um, zebrafish can be a really good model system for studying this. Um, they're a really nice balance of simplicity, but also uh, cognitive and genetic complexity um, for looking at these particular endophenotypes. So it can really give us the ability to look into detail at the underlying biology of some of these um, endophenotypes. Um, and we've also, you know, again, we've been working with working memory and impulsivity and using these uh, techniques, we've uncovered already some potentially new pathways uh, using zebrafish, uh, which we can test more in the future. So for my final slide, just to say uh, what, what the future directions are. So um, part of what we're interested in doing is using what we call drug repurposing or drug repositioning, which is where we reposition or use existing drugs that have already been through clinical trials. So it kind of cuts down on the cost and so on um, to try to target some of these uh, mechanisms that we uncover within these within these animals. So once we find genetic lines or we find, you know, particular endophenotypes, either within aging or whatever, um, we can then target those molecules mechanisms with drugs that are known uh, to work on those mechanisms to try to see whether we can help with some of the symptoms. Um, we're also doing some work looking at um, you know numbers of genetic lines so screening studies where we look at um, lines with, with uh, lots of genetic mutations that we might not have linked previously to disorders uh, to try to understand for example um, uh, genetics underlying Alzheimer's and so on. So that's it. I did run over by about five minutes, so apologies for that. But just uh, just before I finish, to say thanks to my um, PhD students who did a lot of that work that I've just shown you, Barbara, James and Madeline, um, also collaborators um, all around the world in the UK and so on, and all our technical staff. And then at the bottom, all of the different funders and partners and so on that are involved with uh, making all of this work possible. And again, if you want to look at any of it in more detail, um, please go to parkerlab.com. Um, uh, or look at my Twitter, which has got it on there, um, and you'll learn more. So that's it. If you've got any questions, then please do fire away. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I think I'm, I'm sure I speak on behalf of everyone listening to um, Dr. Matt Parter, Parker's um, lecture, um, that not only is he an amazing linguist being able to pronounce all of those incredible words, um, he's got an amazing passion for his um, fascinating um, experience with the zebrafish and how they, they can be applied to humans, and also a very flexible and fluid approach to research in, in um, moving his way through different avenues of research that linking up not only the sort of biochemistry um, with the sort of, with, yeah, with, with the psych psychiatry and um, particularly um, of interest um, thinking about um, the precision psychiatry. Um, so yeah, I've, I've, I've got a couple of things I, I was wondering about asking while people might be thinking about, um, thinking about their questions. Um, yeah, in particular, I was, I was wondering, um, so with the, with the application of the zebrafish um, research that you've been looking at, um, both for sort of working memory and impulsivity, um, how, do, how, um, how sort of easy or, or how, how do you work sort of collaboratively with um, people working in towards the human um, area of clinical research? And I know that you've got, um, that you do have, um, so I mentioned briefly at the beginning that you have an active clinical research program as well. How I think the bigger picture really is 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 how will it how will it you know you be able to channel your your research findings into the wider field? Yeah, that, that's you know it's a, it's a good question. I mean, so I, I should start by saying that you know within within biological sciences, you know that there's we often describe it as bench to bedside. You know, so you have this whole research throughput pathway if you like where you start off with fundamental research which is where you understand the molecular mechanisms underlying a disorder uh, you then you know this is the sort of classical way of doing it you then potentially uh, based on that um, you know decide to target a particular molecule with a new drug you then develop that drug develop a way of getting that drug in to clinical trials and, and so on and so on um, now with with the kind of work that i do in terms of the psychiatry side of it <clears throat> 
it's a little bit different because um, essentially what, what we're two problems. One, one problem is, is, you know, you, you have very difficult to define populations. So as I mentioned before, you've got this, you know, with human disease, if somebody has, I don't know, breast cancer, you know that that's breast. I mean, it's, there might be slightly different types of breast cancer, but you know that that's, that's what that condition is. And it has a very specific biological signature and you kind of know how to treat that or how to deal with it. With psychiatric conditions, it's like having all sorts of different things which are lumped together because they share some kind of similarity. So when we, when we do our work, we're, we're at the fundamental end trying to understand those you know, molecular mechanisms that might underpin some very specific behaviours. But at the clinical end, I, you know, there's no point in my view of doing this work if you don't have any impact or don't have any applications to it. So um, what we try and do is whenever we whenever we make a discovery in zebrafish, for example, um, we very, very quickly move to a, um, a kind of subclinical human population to try to understand whether that behavioral phenotype is important within a disorder so i'll give you alcohol use uh, substance abuse as, as an example of that so we did loads of work years ago looking at um uh, zebrafish in terms of their preference for alcohol and how they respond to alcohol and um, things like how they respond uh, to stress uh, when they've had alcohol and, and things like that and that led to uh, some research questions surrounding you know whether stress might be an important catalyst uh, for, for people moving from, uh, you know, occasional alcohol use into addiction. So we, we designed some experiments with humans where we looked into the impact of stress uh, and personality type and how they interacted to, to form, you know, to, to create alcohol craving. Now, while that was still going on, um, we found some very strong data early on, some very convincing data. So we immediately uh, got in touch with the hepatology department at the hospital um, who uh, have an alcohol lead, who is very interested in, you know, trying to help people that have alcohol, uh, you know, substance abuse problems and so on. Um, and we immediately linked up with them and we initiated um, a, a clinical research program whereby we were taking people that had come into a hospital with alcohol problems and were looking at the underlying factors to see how it goes up the chain. So we're very much about taking that initial fundamental work and moving it up the chain as quickly as possible. Now, I'm slightly odd in that respect because a lot of people tend to focus on one thing. Uh, but I think because the work that I do is quite applied in the sense that we're looking at disorders that you know we're familiar with and that we kind of know i feel like we're at a, a reasonably good point that we can move quite quickly through those different stages so really that that bench to bedside is something that we try to incorporate into everything we're doing as i said before i don't see the point in doing stuff if we're not going to immediately try and figure out how to apply it to humans we've done similar stuff with our alzheimer's with the y maze that's currently being uh, trialed at the moment in alzheimer's patients with with southampton uh, hospitals trust um so yeah we, we we try to push this all the way through yeah that's fantastic so yeah you, with that answer you've just really demonstrated your sort of dynamic and flexible approach and i think that's really valuable for people thinking about a career in in research scientific research of how exciting it is to look down different avenues and be sort of big picture thinking um i'm just going to have a look i think we've got um so let me look in the chat. Um, we've got a question from, um, yes, yeah, so from, um, so I'm not going to be able to pronounce this very well, um, Zivil, um, thank you for an amazing lecture. I was wondering if you're doing any research in understanding autism and finding potential treatments. I feel like this disorder is still not well known. Yeah, no, that, that's, a, that's a really good question. We, we um, in my lab, we haven't, we haven't really been doing a lot on autism. I, I've got a couple of collaborators who are, and there are people that are doing autism in fish. Um, one of the things I didn't mention, <coughs> excuse me, in this lecture was about fish, um, is that they are very social. Um, the, you know, the, the shoaling and, and, and so on, they're, they're very social animals. I mean, they don't, people have done work on their social networks, in fact, where they look at, um, you know, very complex, multi-level social interactions that get formed within fish shoals. And, you know, a go, you know, people think, oh, fish have only got a two second memory. They haven't. Uh, goldfish, uh, well, in fact, zebrafish as well, can remember their shoal mates. So fish that they know for two weeks. So if you, and probably longer, but that's how long people have looked at it. 
um, I wrote a piece uh, of, for the, the conversation online and somebody sent me a message on that saying that um, they, they had evidence that it was much longer, but it's unverified. But, that, you know, that we know definitely that they can recognise shell mates up to two weeks later. So because uh, social interaction is a hugely important part of autism, it's part of the triad of impairments, as you know, I'm sure, um, we, we have a good measure of stereotypic behaviour, which is another one of the triad of impairments, where they do the repetitive behaviour. Um, and we're looking into that with our YMAs, and we've published several papers on that at the moment anyway, looking at repetitive behaviour. Um, um, so once we build in the social behaviour and so on, instead of looking at autism as a disorder, because I don't know how you would get an autistic fish, you know, I don't know how that would, you know, whether how you would be able to look, think about recurring thoughts and stuff, it would be a bit tricky. So using the transdiagnostic endophenotype approach, I think by looking at things like impulsivity, stereotypy, um, impaired social behaviour, um, we may well get to a point where we're able to look at certain aspects of autism. But again, I think it's important to remember that I, I don't I don't think it's particularly useful as a person who does work with animals to try and say it's an animal model of whatever disorder. It's more looking at aspects of that disorder that the animals show within their naturalistic behavioral repertoire that has an obvious biological benefit to that animal within its ecological niche because if it does then you can study that and then you can study what goes wrong with that and then that will potentially give you a, a kind of a, a way in to understand the human more complex multifaceted version of that if that makes sense yeah brilliant yeah thank you so much for that um fantastic answer let's just see um yeah if anyone else has got any other questions um yeah don't be shy um Quite, um, Matt's quite happy to ask um, answer any questions on anything um, that you've got to, that you'd like to know about. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm particularly interested as well in this sort of precision psychiatry. Do you think it will um, translate into, um, I know now they're trying to do more sort of, um, do you think you might be able to use the sort of genomic sequencing that you were saying you've, you've kept a lot of um, lineages of for your zebrafish into then um, translating that into your precision psychiatry? Yeah, I mean, we, we, you know, we, we do. So I guess there's two, there's two ways of answering that. I mean, I, we, we do have some, some knockout lines that we have that specifically have knockouts in genes that we know are related to the human version of the condition. Um, and we have, we have schizophrenia lines. So we have a, a line called disc one, which is disrupted in schizophrenia one, which is the main gene, which has been linked to schiz schizophrenia in terms of heredity and stuff. We have, um, the latrophilid line, which I already mentioned, is related to ADHD, which we know in humans is related to ADHD. And then we have, um, I work with people from Australia where we look at Alzheimer's. So we have a whole bunch of early onset familial Alzheimer's genes, which aren't necessarily related to idiopathic Alzheimer's, but they, things like prednisolin one and so on. But we know that they're, we know that they're related to Alzheimer's as a, as a neurological construct, but we don't know if they're related to idiopathic or that, anyway, for various reasons. So, so we use those lines, again, in order to understand particular behaviors. So what we want to know is, okay, in this line, what behaviors are disrupted specifically? We, it doesn't matter about the other stuff. We just want to know what behaviors are specifically disrupted in this line. So then once we know that, then we can understand that in, in you know, kind of crazy levels of molecular detail. And once we understand how losing that gene impacts not only on behavior, but on, um, you know, molecular function, everything like that, then that gives us an insight into targets for drugs, which might help some of the symptoms of those disorders. Yeah. So, so yeah. We're, we're not particularly interested in, oh, you know, we're like, you know, genome editing, that kind of stuff. I mean, we really just say, OK, look, we know that this gene is very important what aspect of that disorder makes that gene important because the fact that you get all these transdiagnostic uh, phenotypes and so on suggests that there are you know shared underlying mechanisms now we don't know whether those mechanisms are you know molecular or whether they're social it may be that you know for example i don't know working memory in schizophrenia is affected because they have some kind of psychological impact on memory based on other non-pyramidal symptoms so it doesn't necessarily mean that the working memory is biologically involved it might mm. you know uh, sort of you know uh, superficially involved so that's why we use these lines to understand specifically about those behavioral endophenotypes and the biological signatures associated with them and then use that to try and discover new molecular processes which could then be uh, potential drug targets in the future 
yeah that's brilliant thank you yeah um we've got one other um question here um so this is from rihanna okay just coming off the end of that question and answer do the natural behaviors of zebrafish need to be considered at all so do the natural behaviors of zebrafish need to be considered at all when doing this sort of research and how well does it translate to humans thank yeah. you for that question and thank you that's a, that's a fantastic question yeah so um i'm you know i'm, I'm not here to say that uh, zebrafish are tiny human beings because they're not right there are key differences between um you know humans and zebrafish physiologically anatomically evolutionarily i mean in terms of the genome i mean as i said zebrafish have undergone a genome duplication event which means that uh, you know they're 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 um, they're different from humans in, in, in all kinds of different ways at, at varying different levels. Now, you know, in terms of the sort of phylogenetic tree, you know, if you go high enough, high enough, yeah, well, low enough, you know what I mean? If you go back enough, um, then, you know, you have shared traits with your ancestors. And then at some point those traits, you know, split off and so on. Now, the issue is, is to what extent can we, you know, extrapolate you know from those sort of very ancient evolutionary traits which are you know the basic motivational drives and the you know whether that be for food for you know reproduction or whatever you know those very basic motivational drives um exist right the way down the sort of vertebrate chain if you like so you know we we are not trying to say that, that zebrafish are like humans what we're trying to say is that particular behaviors now these might be as your question uh, was suggesting these might be behaviors that are specific to zebrafish um and, but we don't necessarily know that that's why we have to do the study because if we see for example social behavior in a zebrafish do we know that that social behavior in a zebrafish is the same as in a human well the chances are no i mean right we you know social behavior in humans is probably related to very different things but at the same time they both show some underlying you know desire or motivation to be in that social situation so when you take that behavior down to the basic building blocks that's when those molecular processes might become very important so things like working memory you know we all have working memory other animals have working memory fish have working memory and we saw from the way that we compared those behaviors when you put them in those very similar you know slightly abnormal weird situations they all show the same thing so that kind of betrays that ancient evolutionary history right because you know the fish uh, the mouse uh, and the human all show that very similar kind of pattern when you put them into that environment that is what they do so we use that kind of framework if you like for trying to explain how fish are useful models for human behavior in the sense that you know there are behaviors which they show at a common level you know at a very low common level like things like impulse control which we demonstrated no one had seen that before because no one had really looked at it but when you get down to it impulsivity seems to be a evolutionarily conserved trait so their natural behavior as you were saying doesn't it, it kind of matters but it only matters insofar as are they able to do this task can they be trained to do it and we use you know behavioral psychology essentially you know behavioral training like the way you might train a dog using reinforcement contingencies in order to train those animals to perform behaviors that we want them to perform and then we can look at those underlying circuits so yeah i mean i i, I think you know it's, it's a really good question and i think it's uh it's something that's it, it's important to consider and you have to consider the limitations and not try to look at things that you can't which is why as i said before you you probably can't look at all aspects of depression and so on in a fish because how would you look at kind of depressive ruminating thoughts and stuff you can't so don't look at that in a fish yeah. and try to you know um yeah thank you so much matt i think we've got um time for um make one more question i mean if anyone else has one more after this um so this is from i think it's daisy lee i hope i'm right with that um um, so she's written, um, yeah, so um, yes, yeah, thank, thank you for the, for the lecture. And because of, um, because a lot of psychiatric disorders are polygy, she's written polygenetic, um, does your research sort of help to tease out the role each candidate gene plays in, in humans? Yeah, so I, I mean, that's, yeah. um, because a lot of... I got it, I got it. Now that's, okay. that's, that's yeah. 
that's a really, 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 really good question. And it's, it's something that comes up every time I give a talk, usually at psychology conferences. I wouldn't probably get this question at a neuro conference because they know the answer. But at psychology conferences, it always pops up and colleagues always ask me this when they're trying to understand. So it's a really good question. Basically, there are, there are two ways that you can look at, and this goes back to what I was saying about animal models, right? If you, so you, you as you rightly said, um, human neuropsychiatric condition, all of these are polygenic, right? So they, they, they have a huge number of genes, probably different gene pathways that are involved. You know, there's, it's, it's very rare. I mean, it, apart from potentially in the case of like Huntington's disease and so on, it's very, very rare for there to be a single genetic polymorphism or mutation or whatever uh, that causes a psychiatric disorder. That's the first thing. So that is exactly the reason why we don't talk about zebrafish as models for human disorders, right? So what we try and look at is out of those polygenic traits, out of those several genes that might be, you know, differentially regulated and pop up in a, a genome-wide study that shows that it's differentially regulated in, in people with a particular disorder, we want to know, okay, what role does that gene play? That's the trans that's the, the, the kind of the middle bit, the endophenotype on that thing I showed you before what does that gene do in terms of uh, behavior and in terms of, uh, in terms of, you know, uh, uh, cognitive patterns. And of course you can't really look at that in humans because it's polygenic, right? So you've already got a problem. So if I take somebody who's got depression or whatever, um, and I try and look at their genetics, they're going to have all of these different genes differentially regulated or whatever. So it's not going to help me. Right. So animal models therefore become really useful because you can look and you can go, OK, right. So we know this gene's involved. Let's find out what that gene's responsible for. It's not going to be the whole, you know, the whole plethora of different symptoms. It's probably going to be one thing. So we look at what that one thing is and then we can say, ah, OK, so we know that out of these 20 genes that are differentially regulated in ADHD, latrophilin three is responsible for the impulsivity part of it not the hyperactivity or the inattention part and actually if i showed you the rest of our data that's what the answer is it's not involved with inattention it doesn't make any difference to inattention it doesn't make any difference to hyperactivity but it does matter for impulsivity so we know theoretically now that impulsivity in adhd is related to latrophilin but not necessarily the other traits okay um yeah that's fantastic has anyone else got a last question Oh, I think um, I think actually um, we've come to a time um, that we say really thank you so much um, to um, Dr. Matt Parker um, and what a fantastic um, science communicator he is, um, helping to make sense of um, some very complex um, biochemical, behavioural, um, cognitive um, and psychiatric um, disorders. And the fact that he really wants to make sense of it and, and to explain it to help society um, in tackling and um, treating um, psychiatric disorders. So we're really great, very grateful to you for all of the research that you're doing and particularly um, thankful for you for your um, fantastic talk um, this evening. Thank you so much.